It attracted more than a billion viewers worldwide, one of the most watched television events ever. People were mesmerized as the 33 Chilean miners stepped from darkness into light. It might have been the greatest rescue operation since Noah's Ark. And the miners? They were lionized, living proof that in this software century, courage and endurance have not disappeared. Well, they're back home now in Copiapo, a mining town planted in the driest desert in the world. We flew down there to check out how they're doing and to find out what was really going on those 69 days half a mile under the earth. Before the rescue, the 33 made a pact of silence. Nonetheless, several opened up to us, talked about things they'd been keeping to themselves. As you will learn tonight, much of their story hasn't been told. The story will continue in a moment. Four months ago, this was the stage for one of the most compelling dramas of our time. There's not the slightest trace of that now, not even an empty Coke can. This is the entrance to hell on earth. The miners were five hours into their day shift when their world collapsed. Workers on the surface said it sounded like a volcano exploding. They were shocked, they said, but not surprised. The San Jose mine has one of the worst safety records in the region. The first rescue team didn't get very far. 300 yards from here, the underground road was blocked by a boulder twice the weight of the Empire State Building. With the 33 still alive, the odds were put at 2%. Half a mile underground, Victor Zamora was repairing the roof of the mine when the force of the collapse plastered him against a wall. He stumbled to the shelter where food was meant to be stored for just such an emergency. There was enough for a couple of picnics. How did you react to that? We were so mad. There was almost nothing there. We couldn't believe that we were supposed to survive with so little. We were treated even worse than animals. It was shocking. Three days after the collapse, the rescue team started sending probes down. Trouble was, they had no idea where the miners were. All they had were sketches which were outdated and inaccurate. But they kept on drilling, day and night. The noise was deafening. The miners would hear the probes come close and then stop. It drove them crazy. But once, mechanic Alex Vega thought he heard salvation. I'd say the probe went by no more than two meters from our shelter. You heard the probe go down two meters from where you were? Yes, it went by real close. Do you remember what you felt when you realized that the probe was not going to come where you were? Yes, I lost hope. I was desperate. And so were the families who pitched tents outside the mine. They called it Camp Hope, and some never lost it, even though for 16 days there was no sign of life. What the families didn't know, and what has not been reported until now, is just how close their men came to doing themselves in. I said to a friend, well, if we're going to continue suffering, it would be better for all of us to go to the shelter, start an engine, and with the carbon monoxide, just let ourselves go. Were you the only one who suggested that, or were there other miners who felt the same way? I think all of us. All of you were thinking about committing suicide. At that moment, it wasn't really committing suicide. It was to not continue suffering. We were going to die anyway. We wanted to get some idea of what it must have been like down there. So we asked writer Jonathan Franklin who obtained a backstage pass to the rescue operation to take us down a nearby mine. It had been run by the same company. There's been quite a few mini cave-ins around here. We had to scramble over rocks and rubble in pitch black tunnels to get where we wanted to go, to the part of the mine which most resembled the diabolical world where the men were entombed half a mile underground. You know, we all knew that the miners spent 69 days underground. We knew it. But being down here is knowing it, knowing it really 
I mean, the idea of 69 days here is terrifying. We're only one quarter the depth that they were, one quarter. You'd have to go down another 500 meters, and in, where they were, it was wet and humid. Even under these conditions, the men maintained remarkable discipline. They voted on everything. They stuck to a daily schedule, a general meeting, followed by a prayer service, then what they called dinner. Franklin, who gained unprecedented access to the miners, has written a book called 33 Men. He says the men always divided their food evenly, even when they were down to one teaspoon of tuna every 48 hours. But by day 16, he says, the miners were all starving and realized they'd have to eat the first man who died. They told me that they had a pot and a saw ready. Do you think that the potential candidates knew who they were? One of the candidates told me that the guys had been joking, hey, if you die in your sleep, you know, you're going to be breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So he, those last few nights, he said he couldn't sleep. He was too afraid that if he died, that his companions would end up eating him. Mario Sepulveda, who emerged as the leader of the group early on, says he thought it was only a matter of time. How long do you think it would have been before you had to do it? I would say five or ten days. I don't know. But I was going to get out of there no matter what. Food or no food, I was going to get out of there. How? I had to think about which miner was going to collapse first. And then I started thinking about how I was going to eat him. I promise you, I wasn't embarrassed. I wasn't scared. But they were saved by the drill. On day 17, it came punching through the ceiling. All thoughts of cannibalism and suicide disappeared into the dust. When the drill finally broke through, do you remember what you were feeling? I was so weak. I couldn't even stand, and then all of a sudden I found myself jumping for joy. It was like celebrating New Year's Eve or having a newborn child. Rescuers on the surface heard pounding on the drill. When they pulled it up, they saw paint on it, red paint. Then they found a note attached to the bit. It said... We are fine in the refuge, the 33. They sent down a camera, and the world peered into the dark eyes of a stunned survivor. Then, there they were, 33 haunted men, trying to appear cheerful, to wave, to smile for their families. They just couldn't pull it off. Some had lost 50 pounds. Mario Sepulveda played the host in what became a reality show, Survivor Underground. He took the viewers around what had become their home, the casino, the clinic, the post office. And that's where conflicts with the rescuers began. Psychologists were censoring and tampering with the letters the miners wrote and received. They wanted to keep the messages light and cheerful. The 33 were outraged. They treated us like we were completely ignorant and stupid. It was totally unacceptable that they were reading intimate things that we were writing to our wives. I understand that you guys got so angry that there was something of a mutiny. There were some really tense moments, yes. But tension turned into joy on day 69, the day of liberation. The fittest men went up first. Mario Sepulveda was the second to reach the top. He seemed happy to be there. Victor Zamora, the roof repairman, made a movie of it all. The rescuers landing, getting suited up for the ride. Then liftoff and 20 minutes in a magic capsule. The docking and a love scene. Hollywood couldn't have done better. The 33 were treated to a victory tour. Highlights, meetings with America's top celebrities, galas, where they just kept on receiving awards, an appearance on the David Letterman show. Minor Edison Pena didn't have the slightest idea who Letterman was, but he was having a wonderful time. Back in Copiapó, though, Peña was hospitalized for anxiety and depression, and he was not alone. Mario Sepulveda, that most exuberant of men, is on heavy medication. 
The oldest miner, Mario Gomez, finds it impossible to sleep. And Alex Vega? He can't explain why he's doing it, but he's building a wall around his house. Whenever I hear a noise, I get scared and look around me. My heart beats faster, I can't go into small spaces, I'm taking five or six pills a day now. If I don't take them, I can't sleep, and I wouldn't even be able to sit with you. All but one of the 33 men, doctors say, have suffered severe psychological problems since the accident. And the miners complain they're not getting the quality medical care and benefits they need and were promised. Nineteen of them have already lost their disability payments. Sebastian Pinera is Chile's president. A couple of the miners told me that they feel like they're soldiers, they're heroes during the war, and when the war is over, they're forgotten. Well, that's part of life. That's part of human nature. They were heroes. They will always be heroes. You know, if any of these miners get really ill, the story could still have an unhappy ending, couldn't it? Yes, yes. And we are worried about that. But each of them, they have to come back to their normal lives, to their families, find a new job. That's what the president said to you. What do you say to the president? I'm an underground mining mechanic. That's what I do. And I won't be able to do it anymore. What do you want to do? I've tried to work fixing cars and other kinds of vehicles, but I lose my concentration very quickly. I forget things. Right now, I don't know what's going to happen with my future. And Victor Zamora? He walked with us to the mine. It was his first time back since the accident. He told us he feels he still hasn't been rescued. Before I went in here, I was a happy guy. But now I'm having nightmares, I'm having problems. I'm not the same person. What kind of nightmares are you having? Being trapped, watching my friends around me die. Rocks falling. The other me is still in there. Do you miss him? I can't have a normal relationship with my family. I'm, I'm not as affectionate with my child as I was before. It's very difficult. What's it like just looking at this place now? Tristeza. Sadness. Lots of sadness. I'd prefer to be dead. Even today, not everyone understands what can happen to people after they've been in hell. But the miners know they say the mine is a vengeful goddess who exacts a price for her copper. Sometimes the price is death, sometimes survival.